on this episode of Feel Dumb for Asking. To just get Christians to invite people to something rather than empowering Christians who are disciples of God to invite people to someone. And now, Ronnie and Bo. All right, well, it's Feel Dumb for Asking with Ronnie and Bo. And um, Bo, are you... Are you to the point yet where you don't have to feel dumb for asking these questions. Well, that was a real dumb question you just asked me, Ronnie. Oh, but don't feel dumb about it. Dang it. No, wait a minute, huh? <laughs> no, this is great. I, I love this. And you know what I love most is the uh, guests that we get to talk to. Uh, and we've got a fantastic guest. We have by far the tallest guest. Is he? That we have had so far to date. How tall is he? He's uh, eight foot two. My goodness. Yeah. So if he, if he made it to eight five, he might have made the high school basketball team. <laughs> Seriously. Well, we'll we'll hear more about uh, his fascinating height. Okay. And how that influences his life. But uh, our guest today is named Brian Holland. He's he's actually. Uh, Pastor Brian Holland, and as I like to refer to him, Brian is one of my favorite communicators. Uh-huh. And and Brian's a pastor at Purpose Church in Southern California. And uh, and and there was a brief moment I was in seminary for like five minutes. Okay, and Brian and I were in the same seminary. Well, that's great uh, class. And so um, known him for a long time, and dear dear friend, phenomenal pastor, great communicator, and our privilege right now. To introduce to you on Field Dumb for Asking, Mr. Brian Holland. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, how are you? Man, I should have you come with me everywhere I go. You can introduce <laughs> me because I don't usually feel this good about myself. <laughs> That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Um, Thank you. So, Brian, are you holding up okay out there in Southern California? Yeah, it's a uh, it's definitely a different it's a different place out here, but we are doing just fine. Um, <laughs> we're, we're making it. That's good. I know it's been a tough year for everybody, and uh, but but we're heading in the right direction, at least as far as uh, COVID's concerned. Um, are you uh, are you still having to mask up or avoid everywhere, or is, is stuff starting to lighten up? You know, some uh, things are starting to lighten up out here. Um, I mean, mostly when we go inside, uh, they want us to wear masks still. But even restaurants, uh, it's kind of like if when you're walking to your table, you wear the mask when you sit down and you're inside. Yeah, you don't have to wear it. Um, parks you don't have to wear them anymore i mean so it's and i think come so supposedly the middle of june it's going to kind of be open like it's like it was okay so we'll see that i'm hoping that still happens but what's that in church is it uh still masked or it's 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 uh, evolving you know it's it's kind of dependent upon the pastor and the church community i mean i know some that they've fought the whole time and they're going to meet no matter what and we took a different approach just because when we look at the community where our church meets, um, they were taking very, the community was taking very seriously that they need to wear masks. Yeah. And so I didn't feel like it would be honoring to Jesus to still meet no matter what. It's almost like, <laughs> I always, well, I don't know if this is appropriate to say, but <laughs> I always feel like if, if, I, if I did that, it'd be like giving the people the finger as they drove by instead of saying, Hey, we want to be a church community that's sensitive. So yeah. we stayed online for a good chunk of time. And then just, this uh, this past January, we started meeting outside with masks and bring your own chairs. And I actually think people like it better outside than going in back into the gym that we meet in. So I could it's worked that. out. And our church community has just been, I mean, I lead the Claremont campus for Purpose Church. There's a Pomona one that's been around for a while. I lead the smaller one. Our little, our little community has just been so great. I haven't had one argument, one fight about any of this. They just, they just go with the flow. Which wow, actually, things look there. like the church. I think you're yeah. the one human being, especially in ministry, <laughs> that <laughs> has not had a fight in the last 14, 15 months. Congratulations! Blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's I'm amazing. totally. I'm totally going to take advantage of that and yeah. just take the credit for it, thinking I did that, you and then I can write so that well. book. <laughs> I'll write the book that thousands of people will read. I'll retire, and I, then I can just go and do my own thing. It'd be beautiful. Oh, that's too good. Well, Brian, that's a good segue into our question for this episode. And the question that we're going to tackle today is, what is the church supposed to look like? And so mm-hmm. that's, that's such a big question, because I think when we think church, I mean, Bo, for you, what's the first thing, that, or a handful of things that come into mind when you think church? Well, I don't know. Uh, one is architecture of the building. Yep. The place yeah. of where Some the location. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, two, uh, the philosophies. Yeah. 
uh, of the teachings. And yeah. Three, the, 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 the folks that are in it. Yeah. And what type of folks, the demographics, right? Yeah. Those yeah. are some of the things that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Brian? I mean, it's stereotypically, what do you find that people think of when they think church? Yeah, I think the the stereotypical things that come to people's minds. I think Bo, you mentioned it first. It's it's the building. It's, huh. the, yeah. it's the location. Yeah. I also think it's uh, it's the worship service because yeah. how often do you hear yeah. people say, "Hey, you want to come to church?" Yeah. And I've never I've never invite anybody to to my family outings or our family gatherings. Hey, you want to go to family? It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we've turned it into. It's the place, like you're going to go to church, but then the worship service on a Sunday morning has become the church. Right. And I just, I, that, I guess there's just a, there's just something I feel like God's been hitting me over the last few years, especially. Right. Well, maybe I, we're supposed to get back to something. That's that's great because I think the the church, you know, over centuries now has kind of um, the methodology of church kind of morphs and changes. Uh, the message doesn't, but uh, I think somewhere in the last couple of thousand years of church, the definition has really been lost. And obviously, if if we look to God's word for what church was supposed to be, then I think you're right. Maybe getting back to something is, is the right way to go. So w- what would you say, Brian, if we try to answer that question, what's the church supposed to look like? What what are some things that you would uh, highlight or draw us to? Yeah. Um, I remember it was a few years ago. I was reading a book. I don't know which one it was, but they, they defined the word ecclesia. Uh And as they're explaining it, they said, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a Jesus word. It's not a religious word. It was actually a word that it was, the definition was a gathering of people brought together to fulfill a purpose. Hmm. And when I think of that, and and just for people wondering that ecclesia, I mean, what, what language would that be reference? Is that, that Greek? Yeah, so that'd be the Greek language in the and New that Testament. would be the Greek word for for church that right. that we use for church now. Okay, and you said right. what a gathering of people. It, yeah, it's a gathering of people brought together to fulfill a purpose. Hmm. And so when you hear that as the definition, and then you compare it to what we've kind of turned it into, and it's not just the last few years. I think it's been the last many decades. It's it's just something that you go to rather than the yeah. community that comes together to fulfill something. Yeah. And so when I look at the church and think, okay, so if people look at the state of our nation and where things are going and moralistically and all these things, I wonder, it's so quick, well, it's so easy for Christians to look and go, okay, look at, look at how the quote unquote, the world is working. Look at how they're just running from God. Mm. But if people don't know Jesus, we can't expect them to act as if they do know Jesus. And then two, what if what if the problems we see is connected to the fact that the church hasn't been being the church the way that Jesus wants the church to be? Hmm. Hmm. And so I, I look at it and think that maybe there, maybe we're missing something that maybe we're not doing the things we're called to do because we're not being what the church is supposed to be. Yeah, that's huge. Cause I, I mean, we've got this call to be light and be ambassadors and, but if we're kind of stumbling on those blocks, then the, the, watching world is is getting kind of a incomplete or inaccurate or <laughs> rough picture huh right right and so if all that they're thinking of is the church is the place you go to and it's a worship service you have to sit through and during football season i definitely don't want to do that and unless they have a really early service then i can get that out of the way right well if that's all that it is we show up to something and you get some people up front to 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 spread the gospel, which is, I believe, that still happens. Yeah. But what if what if it was the whole church doing it all day, every day? And I'm not saying running out on the street corners and holding the sign. I'm just saying, what if it happened in relationship? And yeah. so if we if we if we were just break down, say there's a hundred million true followers of Jesus in the states, which I think that number is pretty high. Yeah. But say there was. And if everyone brought Jesus up one time this week in a normal conversation with someone that you knew mm-hmm. that's not a follower of Christ, well, a hundred million, a hundred million people will have heard the beginning conversation of of Jesus, yeah, and see where God takes it from there, because we all believe that we're on mission together, but we're on, we're a community of people, not yeah. a place, but a community of people who are brought together to fulfill the purpose, and the purpose is the Great Commission. And the reason you would actually do the Great Commission is because Jesus gave a great commandment. 
Yeah. And so how often have I heard, hey, we're supposed to have this vision. We're going to move forward and reach the world. I get that. But what's the reason behind that? Why should I do that? Yeah. And the reason I should do that is because I love God with everything I've got. And I want to love people because he told me to love people because it's the second greatest commandment. And if I love God and love people, then I'm going to do the things that God wants me to do. I'm going to tell people about the greatest message in the history of the world and mm -hmm. make sure that they know it because I love people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it brings us back to the simplicity of what we're called to do as the church rather than – and this is all questions that I've been thinking through, and I'm not perfect by far. I mean nowhere close to it. Well, you're pretty but. close, Brian. I, I've been for a while. And... <laughs> well, I mean, I am age five. For what yeah. I heard, <laughs> I'm age five. You're very tall, if not very. <laughs> I'm, I'm very tall, and if I had hair, man, I'd be even taller, but I'm not. <laughs> I remember when you came to speak for one of our, our camps, and uh, <laughs> you flew into Phoenix to make the drive up to, to Prescott and then to Flagstaff, where we were doing the camp or wherever it was, and uh, you, you went to the rental car desk. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. they went, oh, you're not going to fit in the car that we had <laughs> specified for you. You're, Absolutely you're, not. And they gave you some hot rod instead, which A was the funniest part. Yeah, I think they give you some Dodge Challenger for, for no upgrade. It was awesome. Which is great, which is, you know, that's nice that uh, that somehow fit for someone that's 8'5", but uh, yeah. that's good. <laughs> Well, that reminds me, Brian, of, of something a church I've been going to recently says it almost every single week. Just, hey, remember that the church is not a place where, but right. a people who. I and, love that. What and, a statement. And it, it's, they've said it so often now that it's, it's drilled that what you're saying in, the building isn't the primary thing, the program isn't the primary thing, that the people are. And yep. that's a big deal. And this might be an unanswerable question, but how do you get there? You know, that concept mm -hmm. of getting 100 million people to just talk about him uh, in their day at the grocery store or while they're ordering food or something. How do you, that's the impossible question, right? <laughs> how do you get that done? Yeah, I, I wish I could answer the one on how to get the 100 million, um, if that's the number. I guess the only way I can do it is I can just start with a couple hundred that I've got. That's good. Yeah. And make it the constant message. I know I've even told it, uh, our community, and we're getting ready come January. Um, we're going to be launched out from Purpose Church to become our own church, which is beautiful. And Purpose Church has been amazing through the whole thing. But I've told I've told our community, friends, this church community will grow when you and I are obedient to what we've been called to do. Because I refuse to put together all these things that fill up calendars that make people overly stressed because they feel the guilt that they need to go to everything that the church is doing. Right. What if we just simply this is the byline I give to our people. Hey, your mission field starts in your zip code. Your oh, mission field good. starts in your zip code. You live like my neighbors are my mission field. Yeah. I feel like in the States, Christians kind of live in the idea of I'll do a short term mission trip somewhere, which are great. They're beautiful and they can be used by God. But then when you come home, you turn it off. Right. And it's vacation. It's home. Yeah. And really what it should be is I'm going on a short term mission trip because I need a little bit of a break from my mission that I'm constantly living among my neighbors. Yeah. And yeah. so if we do that. If, but if I coddle people as they're as a pastor, if I just coddle them and put all this stuff together and just say, hey, bring them here to hear me or here's this event. And don't get me wrong. We'll do like a Halloween boo bash. I think is what we called it. Um, the kids could come. They could wear masks. Yeah. But. I said, bring your friends if you want to, but really this is a chance for the kids to get together because they haven't seen each other forever. And all these things that we do as a community at this location should be supplemental to what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then who would have thought you do this? That, that to even say things like, and if, hey, if you lead someone to the Lord and they come to know Jesus and want to follow him and they don't want to be part of our church community, help them find one. Like, help them find one in the area. Right, even if it's the, not the your own. Yeah. Us, yeah, if it's not your, there's plenty of people that don't know the Lord that we don't have to compete with just the ones who have all the money so they can give to our program. Right. Like right. We can reach people that don't know Jesus and get them connected. Because what if they have the spiritual gift that that other church community actually really needs mm. more of because they don't have enough people to serve in that area? That's so I big. think we can change some things. Well, and, and Brian, how much of it is, you know, I, obviously not to make little of, of actually sharing the gospel, actually having Jesus oriented conversations with people. But I mean, even just 
living out the love and the ethic and the grace, the the yeah. lifestyle of Jesus around people, you know, not instead of, but, but in right. addition to, and, and maybe even certainly before we, we right. speak up, you know, to, to be able to live that out. I mean, that takes as much, <laughs> um, training or prompting, you know, how do you get a hundred million people to start living out? You know, <laughs> I, if Jesus only had an Instagram account, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, then I, we could save the world. <laughs> the problem is that the Jesus Instagram accounts that I follow, he's always wearing skinny jeans and $5,000 <laughs> tennis shoes. And so if that's Jesus, then <laughs> I don't know, but that's a tough one. Yeah. So, so what, what, what do you think, I mean, what you've already given us plenty right there, Brian, but what does that church really look like then? I mean, it's, it's a, it's people who are ready, willing and available, you right. know, to, to love kind of where they're at, not just attend right. something. What else does, was the church supposed to look like? I think we're supposed to also make sure that people know that they are disciples who can make disciples. Mm. And I feel like it's kind of been lost. I feel like we've, we've created a culture um, and I'm part of the problem. I mean, for years and years, and I don't even think I've got it completely figured out and nor will I ever, mm. but to just get Christians to invite people to something yeah, rather than empowering Christians who are disciples of God to invite people to someone that we should be inviting them to Jesus. Mm. So it's empowering. It's releasing them. I mean, really the, the, the role of the pastor and, is to equip the saints for works of service. Hmm. I don't think it's to provide every avenue hmm. telling people, Hey, we've got all these, all these ministry opportunities that we've set up for you, which means you don't have to pray about what you should be doing. We're just going to tell you, and then you can come do it. Yeah. But what if all of a sudden we have a whole community of people? And I know that this may, this may rub some people wrong when they hear it, but what if we looked at people and said, how does God want you to serve in your community? And so there's been times where we've, a few times in the last few years, um, it's usually right around Christmas, we actually shut down the worship service on a Sunday morning. We call it Serve Sunday or Serve Weekend. Mm -hmm. And we say, I want you to pray through how you and your family, if you have kids and are married at home, how can you impact your neighborhood? And it could be something as, uh, it could be something where you're out and about sharing the gospel. It could be I, I knew of a family that they have the cutest kids and the kids set up a lemonade stand at a soccer game. Yeah. And then, so the kids, I mean, what kid, what adult is going to look at a, an adorable kid and say, I don't want any. So they all buy it. Well, not buying it. They're giving it away. And then they're, they're inviting them to a worship service and they're, but they're trying to make relationship because it's people within their, their, within their neighborhood. Yeah. Now I want to see them get to the point where they're bringing it up by themselves. And we're, again, we're supplemental, but it was so cool to hear people making blankets to take the, um, cancer patients at a hospital hmm. or people are picking up trash along in the park and then when they're in the park and they're picking up trash being able to when people go what are you doing they can say oh we just we're serving we're part of a church and we just yeah. want to serve this sunday yeah i feel like it's those kind of things but empowering people to go out and then to see their workplace as an opportunity to see their neighborhood as the opportunity but it all comes from being disciples and it can't ever be started outside of hey i'm a follower of jesus I, I spend time with him. I love him. I'm in his word. I'm in prayer. And then it's weird. I've just been preaching the book of Daniel. In Daniel, in Old Testament book of Daniel, um, there's the king who's pagan king, doesn't I believe in all these other gods. He sure liked Daniel, though, because Daniel could tell him what his dream was and interpret it. Mm -hmm. The first time he did that was in chapter two. The second time he did it was in chapter four that's mentioned. And there's at least a 20-year gap between those times. But Nebuchadnezzar, he has this dream, can't figure it out, and says something like, okay, I want all of my magicians and enchanters to come to me to tell me the dream. None of them can do it. And then there's a verse that says, at last Daniel came. Hmm. And I thought, the reason that Daniel stood out is because, think about it, Daniel simply stayed faithful to what God had called him to do in a land that he didn't want to be in, that he was taken into captivity, but he lived a faithful life that made such an impact that the king of the king of the land, the king of Babylon, saw him as his favorite. Even though Daniel was having to learn things he didn't want to learn, hear things he didn't want to hear, 
he was faithful and God used him. And Daniel outlasted the administration. <laughs> Daniel outlasted the next. It's like Daniel just stayed faithful in the place that God had put him. But he lived out his faith. But there's a phrase in there that Nebuchadnezzar said something like, and I can see that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Mm-hmm. Now, theologically, there's not more than one God. But when we look at it and go, Nebuchadnezzar saw the difference that was in Daniel because the spirit of God was in Daniel. Mm-hmm. And you have this guy who wouldn't believe what Daniel believed, but he's going to Daniel for advice because the spirit of God was alive in Daniel. And we as followers of Jesus The only way that that happens is that we're spending time alone with God on a regular basis as disciples. Instead of thinking, first, what will I do for God? It's more, hey, what what will I do in spending time with the Lord? And God, what do we get to do together? Instead of me living, I I always use this phrase, instead of us living for Christ, maybe maybe we should be living with and by Christ. That way he's part of it rather than completely separate. Mm. Brian, can you say all of that again? Because I'm taking notes for my sermon this Sunday. And <laughs> I, I, I kind of... We can I, just play it back. I, we can play it back. Okay. Uh, you know, oh, you, good. You, you, can listen, yeah, you can listen to the podcast and slow it down. Oh, good, good. Because I couldn't keep up... <laughs> I, I couldn't spell Nebuchadnezzar a couple minutes ago. <laughs> I lost. Neither can I. That's why I just call him Ned. <laughs> you know, uh, I like no, what you said it's uh, really good. a moment ago because you know I I'm the disc jockey of the three of us. So uh, so allow that. <laughs> yes. But um, you know I, when you when you when when I do my nightly prayers or whatever, it's 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 very interesting what you said. It struck a chord with me because you say, you know, uh, God, thank you for the blessings you've given me. Mm. Um, or, or God, please help us with this. Uh, give me patience or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and, right. and it's, and, and every once in a while, just being a layman, I'll say, you know, God, thank you for the blessings. Thank you for this. And, and thank you for the path that we are on. And when you said that, that really, you know, uh, we all want something from God in a prayer, right? We're all thankful uh, to God for a prayer. Mm-hmm. But I think the last thing is, is we forget that, you know, look, you're unemployed, you're arguing with your spouse, whatever. This is a journey that we're blessed to take with. And, and, and you, what you just said really struck a chord with me because I don't think, uh, I think that's the last way we look at it or the least yeah. way we look at it. Does that make any sense? And Absolutely. Maybe that's what you just said, but that really struck a chord. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I like it too. A lot of times... Brian, I was going to say, I was gonna say that, go I was going to say that the, the concept of suffering. I, f- I feel like when you look at yes. uh, different worldviews and perspectives, like worldviews and perspectives on the topic of suffering, it's either because there's suffering, there must not be a god. Yep. And I'm like, that's a big jump. That's like saying, well, because I got a bad haircut, there's no such thing as a barber. Like it does. It's yeah, such yeah. a big jump for me because I, I, I really wanted to think about it. I could say. Well, there's so much evil in the world, so God must be evil. I could jump to that conclusion before saying that there's no there's no God. Mm. When you look at the Christian perspective of suffering, and if God is really He's He rules the universe, and yet there's somehow there's human responsibility in things. And I don't understand how that all works out. And that's why I leave it to God to figure that stuff out. But even in Romans, it was weird. I was just talking to a guy before we started chatting today about the concept of suffering and the writer of Romans, a guy named Paul says, not, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Mm. That there's this, there's this good that comes out of suffering. And it, uh, like if we are connected with, okay, if we want to be healthy, well, then we work out. And I remember when I first started working out back in a long time ago, and yet I've always had this struggle with I mean, I love soda so much. It's like I'd have it for breakfast with a, with a donut. But when you show up to the gym and you're on the treadmill and you're walking two miles an hour with a donut and a Mountain Dew, you're really not really – you're not doing anything that's accomplishing anything great. Yeah. But then when, but then I met this guy named Personal Trainer, and I, I remember he made me do things that hurt, but they hurt. Three days late, I couldn't put a jacket on, and yet I thought people pay this guy to do this. Yeah. But now that I've I felt I felt like there's been some victory over the last, especially six months with regards to eating and working out, 
and I feel better, but it only comes through like work, like lifting to failure. And the only way to lift to failure is to go through pain, but I'm physically better because of it. Mm. Mm. That's what scripture comes along. The Bible comes along and says, Hey, no, no discipline or training is pleasant in the moment, mm. but what it brings about, we would never have uh, this appreciation for good had it not been for the suffering that I've had to go through. Mm. And I don't know if this, and uh, then as, yeah. Go ahead. No, keep going. Go ahead. I'm done. No, I was just going to say, uh, you know, in layman's terms, it's uh, you have to take the bad to get the good, right? Uh, you, you need the lows sure. in life to appreciate the highs in life, which is a simplistic approach or a simplistic way to say yeah. that, right? Yeah. And, uh, I, d- I can't appreciate the goodness of God if I don't go through things that are difficult. I can't it? understand his faithfulness if I don't experience times where I'm wondering, is he going to come through? Yeah. All that is necessary. Well, and my daughter was feeling emotional or something and... Uh, uh, she 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 claims it was hormones because she's 13 and she knows everything, uh, but uh, and she she went she, she it was just it was nothing horrific it was a, a sad movie, and she was crying before she went to bed and she said well I just you know I like that movie and it was sad and 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 dad it's probably my my hormones that I'm crying and f- forget that smooth over that and I said to her as 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 she went to bed that night I said. You can get enjoyment and and other things from the sadness and from the you know so that's mm-hmm. that's my non layman way of of, of telling yeah. you you know you got to go through it. you can enjoy a, a a cloudy rainy day right yeah. crying crying Absolutely. in your coffee right yeah there and and what you just said uh, you said it more eloquently and I'm just repeating you but uh, yeah that that makes the other stuff uh, more appreciative and uh, mm-hmm. more appreciate you know whatever. Uh, Anyways, I'm not saying it eloquently enough, but it, it, there's some truth in all that. There is. Yeah, I totally get it. Absolutely. And it's not to downplay. I mean, there's horrific suffering. Right. Absolutely right. around the world. And then welcome the church. Like, right. Isn't that the purpose of the church is to come in and we've been left here by Jesus to impact the world, to bring the gospel, which is, like you look again in that, that letter of Romans, that the I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. We want that, mm. but we're also going to be the people that we're going to make sure that people are fed yeah. and we're going to make sure that people get clothing. We're going to make sure that people get water. I mean, we get to make sure that people's needs are met. We want to be, we want to be agents of reconciliation between mm. people, mm. but it all comes through being reconciled to Christ first. Yeah. Well, that's huge, Brian. Cause that's, I mean, specifically to answering the question, what's the church supposed to look like? Uh, it, it is the hands and feet of Jesus right. and, and often used by God to be the, the mouth of Jesus and extending tangible help, but also spiritual help. And I, I really like how you, you brought it back to the simplicity of the disciples who make disciples but then you talked an awful lot about service. And so I think a lot of times when we hear discipleship, we just think like academic, we just think classroom, yeah. learn this. But but our, our following Jesus was meant to be put into action. And that's that's so true. I think the church should be that way. So as we wrap up, Brian, any more thoughts on what the church should look like? And then one other question for you. Um, how do you see generationally this next wave of generation the, the, the younger than us um, right. responding to or, or needing the church to really be what God intended the church to be. Yeah. Um, humbly, I think the blueprint for the church is in the book of Acts, the whole book, but especially chapter two, 42 yeah. to 47, mm-hmm. because it's this overarching umbrella um, it's just this description of how beautiful the church was. They were devoted to four key things. They're devoted to the apostles' teaching. And these are the apostles who would be, uh, they were the ones that were with Jesus. And so they're just teaching the things of Jesus. Right. And then Jesus taught them how to teach the word. And so they they would you, you'll see you see earlier that Peter preaches and he uses Old Testament passages, which he would have learned from Jesus. Right. Apostles teaching. There's the fellowship, so it's the community. Mm-hmm. The breaking of bread, which could be either eating in people's homes, which I think it's that, but it's also connecting the idea of um, taking communion because that would be connected to that time of eating in each other's houses. Yeah. And then to prayer. Those are the four things they, they did together. They devoted themselves to those things. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, 
it says that they entered the temple courts daily, which means – and the end of Luke says they, they entered the temple and they, uh, they worshiped or they blessed the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so there was this worship. They did it as a daily thing. It wasn't a once a week, got through the hour and 10 minutes, and it, don't make the worship service too long because mm-hmm. the people won't come back. Yeah. But I'm like, can you imagine like, can you imagine me actually saying that to another person? Like, I want to hang out with you, but not too much <laughs> because of my other friends, not mine. Like my people might all want to come back. And I think we're hanging with Jesus. Like we're getting right. some time to as a community right. and we're hanging with one another. So yeah. outside of those four things they devoted themselves to, they, they uh, hung out together, they worshiped together um, and they took care of each other. That was it. Yeah. And then like when you get into it, they, it shows that, they had, the, they had the favor of all the people. Um, everybody loved them. They thought there was something different about these Christians. I mean, and then to think going into each other's houses and having meals together, it was just beautiful. It's community. Mm. And then the, the end of it says, and God must have liked it because the last verse of that passage, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Yeah. And I look at that and go, look at the church. It was so focused on taking care of each other. And if I was to ask, I remember asking probably seven, eight different pastors within about, I don't know, about three months. Hey, what's the main job of the pastor? Mm. Um, I got almost seven different answers. Mm. And I thought, we pastors, we're pretty guilty. Like, can you imagine going up to a plumber and going, hey, what's your job? And then he, like seven different plumbers. And they all have seven different answers yeah. that have nothing to do with plumbing. Right. And so as pastors, our main job, according to when I found it, I felt like God revealed in the book of Acts just in a quiet time. It's to care for God's people. That is yeah. our job. Our yeah. job is to care for God's people because our people are going out and making a difference as the church, as are we as pastors. We're out making a difference. Hmm. And then we got to be together. Hmm. We got to recoup and we got to recover because we're in the battle. I think the other thing I want to make sure people know, uh, I've heard this line, and, and I, I agree that to a, to a degree when you hear that the church is uh, it's, it's a hospital for the sick, not a museum for the saints. Yeah. And I get what's being said. It's like, yeah. we're not perfect. We're not all perfect. But here's the problem. I feel like when we keep it there and the idea that we're, we're a hospital for the sick, then we live sickly lives. Right. But when I look at when I look in scripture and go, I'm a new creation. Yeah. I've been like the old is gone. The new has come. I have the power of the Holy spirit in me. Mm. Then it, then really what the church is, it's a bunch of soldiers who've been, got a bunch of scars and limps. But we're in the battle. Like, we're in it. Like, we're going for it. Like, we have power to do this. And so it's like a mass unit. We're going to go get people, make sure they hear about Jesus. They're going to be, they're going to go to a mass unit until they get strengthened up. And then we're all going to go together on the mission we've been called to. Right. So I think it's so important for us to see ourselves as empowered by God rather than we're just a bunch of broken people who don't know (laughs) what we're going to do. And we're going to sit around until somebody tells us we have God. Yeah. And so Jesus promised the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon them in Acts 1. And that word power there in the Greek language is the word dunamis. And what it means is it's like the power of armies. Mm. It's not just, hey, you're going to be encouraged and have a little bit more strength. I'm going to have the power of the armies at my disposal. Mm. And so what do we need to do for the next generation? I honestly believe the thing that's most attractive to the next generation, as connected as they are, yeah, they're lonelier than ever. And so what we've done for our communities, I know there's uh, churches have done small groups and life groups forever. And I get that. And I think they're beautiful. Sunday school classes back in the day, some still do it. But the part that I wonder about, it's like, I feel like a lot of them are one of them. One of the ideas is that it's people of the same um, stage in life. Mm -hmm. So everyone think about everyone's guessing about what's next. So it's like, well, if we're all parents in our forties and all of our kids are in the same stage, what do we do? Well, this is what I tried and it didn't work. And this is what I tried when it did work. What if you actually had people who weren't your own age, who are older than you and say, this is what we did. Hmm. Let me pour into it. And this is what we did that was helpful. And so our goal at home church, uh, instead of a life group, that seems to be inward focused rather than outward focused. Right. And it seems to be age specific where kids aren't really invited. Yeah. We've created home churches where everyone, um, everyone comes and they're of all different ages. You bring your kids Because the kids will get to know the adults. The adults will joke with the kids. My kids who are teenagers play with the kids. Yeah. It's like a family gathering rather than a study. Right. And so everyone's together. And the byline for our home churches are anyone invites anyone anytime. Mm -hmm. Because we want the growth of God's kingdom, not just our church community, but God's kingdom, 
to come through home churches rather than a worship service. I'm not saying people you can't they can't come to a worship service. Bring anybody you want. Yeah. But I'd rather see people in relationship, all ages together, looking like a family. Mm-hmm. And we share a meal every week. We we spend time in prayer. We spend time reading the scriptures. They say, what if they're not a believer? Well, we eat a meal together, we pray together, and we read the scriptures together. We do the things that the church did in relationship Mm -hmm. because then people might be actually a little bit more open to attending a worship service with people that they already know Mm -hmm. rather than thinking that they're going to come to the – they're going to come to the big production because it's the most impressive thing in town. Right, right. So I think there's got to be a – there's got to be a shift back to the principles that are found in the book of Acts to where we're impacting the family. And when I've seen young people, especially young adults, and when I was doing young adult ministry five, well, six, seven years ago, I, I probably took 30, 30 kids out to lunch over a span of three or four months just to hear them. Right. And I said, what do you guys love about our worship time together? What do you love about our ministry? And they said, every, 100% of them said, the thing we love most is that we're worshiping with people who aren't our own age. Because our Thursday worship service, even though it was young adult focused, all ages were there. They all loved yeah. worshiping with grandparents. They all loved it. Mm. And we've got to get back to what did the church look like so we can apply the principles so that the church will be what God wants the church to be. Today. That's that's huge, Brian. Super thankful for for that. Um, it's it's such a great, robust answer. And it does it comes right from God's word. He's already told us what the church can look like. And a lot of people that um, listen may not be in vocational ministry and might go, gosh, how do I uh, even implement this when I'm just, uh, you know, one of the church? But that's the whole point. I mean, you can be the church because it's not some place that you just go and you can pray for that to happen at your own church. You can get involved and and help uh, bring some of these things to to bear because ultimately the church is is people and looking to the Lord and his word for that direction is so huge. So great. super great. You know, Brian, we do yeah. this thing called feel dumb for asking because we don't want you to feel dumb for asking. And, you know, maybe oh, somebody, <laughs> no, no, no. Maybe somebody would think, you know, I would love the, to ask that type of question, but I'd too, be too nervous to ask that type of question. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. But, but the, but the, that's great. But, but, but the, but the biggest part of that is your participation, Brian, right. and, and you taking the time to answer it and, and helping people with those types of questions. And, and I can't thank you enough right. for that, uh, for being a part of that and being the success of this. Yeah. And as a dear uh-huh. friend, and I know you, you just, you're, you're such a blessing to me and, and really live this out and you get up and, and live and breathe the church. You are a, a, a part of the church and uh, God's using as a leader of the church and been a blessing to us today. So thanks so much for, for joining in with us today, Brian. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Well, thanks, folks. We're so glad you got to tune in. And remember, you never have to feel dumb for asking. Thanks for listening to Feel Dumb for Asking with Ronnie and Bo, available on your favorite podcast provider. Please connect with Ronnie and Bo on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and RonnieandBoShow.com. Send comments to RonnieandBoShow at gmail.com. 